Well, good day. My name is Dan Malone, and welcome to our webinar on improving the relevance of drug drug interaction warnings. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, a warning related to warfarin and SSRI antidepressants. Um, this is part of a ongoing project from our group, and I'd like to uh, quickly highlight the, the members of our team. Apologies here. Um, so we have a number of individuals who have been working on this project over, over the past uh, couple of years, and I appreciate their efforts on, on this project. You'll be hearing from a couple of those these individuals today. So I'd like to provide a brief overview of the webinar and our project, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Phil Hanston, who will go through the specifics related to our uh, interaction of interest for today's webinar. And then uh, I'll turn it over after that to Rich Boyce who talk a little bit about the tools that we've developed uh, to hopefully help inform um, implementation of our uh, proposed uh, algorithm to improve the specificity of this particular uh, interaction warning. So uh, as way of disclosure, um, uh, this is our disclosure slide where Dr. Boyce, Gephardt, Malone, Romero, Sibian, Tan, and Viet, uh, as well as Mr. Uh, Baran and Mr. Chu have no relevant conflicts of interest. And uh, Drs. Hanson and Horn are editors and publishers of their, their own book and have been doing this for quite a while. This work was supported by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, and, but the content is solely the responsibility of us, the uh, investigators. It does not necessarily represent the official views of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So when we talk about drug interactions, the technical definition of a drug interaction is the clinical, clinical meaningful alteration of the effect of one drug as a result of administration of another drug. And we typically call those object and precipitant drugs. And that would manifest in, in a patient uh, resulting in some degree of harm. However, most of the time we're talking about potential drug-drug interactions where it's just administration of the medications and, but we don't necessarily determine if harm ensues. In, in most of the cases that we look at in the literature, um, I'm sorry, look at in a day-to-day -day practice, we tend to see potential drug-drug interactions. Um, but when we look at the literature, we tend to see case reports of, of harm. So, um, we're not gonna draw a huge distinction between these two and as part of our uh, algorithms for today, but yeah, I do want to bring to your attention that a lot of potential drug-drug interactions occur, but they don't necessarily result in harm. And our goal is to try to identify the situations where patients are harmed. So this is a kind of a classic slide from uh, John uh, and Phil. So John Horn and Phil Hanston on our drug interaction defenses. We have lots of um, layers of defenses. If you think of this as the uh, James Reese and Swiss cheese model, where um, the holes represent um, the latent failures in the system and the defenses of the slices of cheese. And it's only when the holes line up do we actually have an adverse drug reaction occur in a patient. So um, we want to avoid, obviously, that scenario. Unfortunately, uh, as a part of setting this up, what we've done is we've created a, a system that just provides a many, many more warnings than um, are, are uh, probably appropriate, given uh, the likelihood that a patient is going to be harmed. And uh, this is from one academic medical center in Tucson from 2016. It just shows the number of, of warnings, um, and these are the, the most common ones that were uh, displayed here. But uh, a huge number of warnings are given. And for those of you that are in uh, uh, clinical production environments, you probably heard the complaints from the uh, practitioners about the overwhelming number of alerts that they get. And that um, they're, um, they're largely ignoring most of these just because um, they're standing in the way of getting work done, taking care of patients. So we, um, myself, uh, at the at the time I wrote this grant at the University of Arizona, Phil and, and Hanston and John Horn from the University of Washington, Rich Boyce from the University of Pittsburgh, and collaborators uh, Sheila Gephardt and Vinish Subian from the University of Arizona put together a project to 
move from what we call conventional alerts to individualized alerts, where we take into account drug factors along with patient risk factors and, and try to create, create a uh, more specific alert um, such that we can reduce the alert volume. So on the drug factors, the risk factors for having an adverse drug event uh, related to a drug interaction, we know there are things such as dose, duration, route of administration, how frequently medications might be administered. The order of, medica order of administration might be important in some drug interactions. Um, the fact that a patient may be on multiple medications with uh, concurrent drug interactions, and also how the uh, drugs are classified into therapeutic classes and how that then is operationalized in the uh, uh, proprietary data sets um, can result in um, um, warnings that may or may not be appropriate. We also know at the patient um, side of things, the individual risk factors could include other comorbidities the patient has. Obviously, um, sex and age are, are commonly uh, examined factors because they're readily uh, observable, but other things like renal function, uh, the pharmacogenomics, which is coming down the pipe as we, we get more and more um, routine measurement of um, uh, patient genotypes, also lab results. So these are things that uh, we, are hope, we hope are, are being integrated in electronic health records such that we can use this information to, to reduce um, uh, warnings when they're inappropriate, but also target those warnings when they are appropriate. So as a part of our project, we've created a webinar series and also a platform to help support the tools that we're developing. So uh, thank you for attending today. I see that we have over uh, 70 attendees on our uh, webinar today. Um, and we plan to do these approximately monthly um, for um, at least a few months. Uh, I don't know exactly when we'll we'll stop broadcasting these on a, on a routine basis, but uh, we plan to do uh, another webinar on the 11th of March and also on the 13th of May, um, focusing on different drug interaction pairs that we're going to focus on today. So each webinar, we're going to try to include information about the clinical pharmacology of the particular drug pair, just so that those of you that may not be pharmacists might be informaticists, understand the, or have an opportunity to understand why we're focusing on this particular interaction and also the mechanism of the interaction. We'll talk a little bit about our algorithm that we've developed and we tried to make these as evidence-based as possible and we're providing tools to give you that evidence as well. And then we've tested these algorithms in both synthetic and, and real world data, you know, looking at, okay, can we operationalize this algorithm and what happens when we do? And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the tools that we have available from our website and other sources, so that if you're interested in implementing the algorithm, um, those tools are available. We'll have a little bit of uh, concern or, or issues about precautions, when, when you should and shouldn't necessarily uh, implement this algorithm, and then um, any other supporting documentation we'll, we'll cover at the end. So what I'd like to do next is turn it over to uh, Dr. Phil Hanston, a professor emeritus from the University of Washington. Phil has been uh, researching and studying drug interactions for uh, quite a while, and uh, he's an uh, expert in the area. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. Dan was, uh, was very kind in not saying how long I've been studying drug interactions, but uh, uh, can I have the next slide, Dan? Okay, today we're going to talk about warfarin uh, being combined with either SSRIs or SNRIs. Most of the data actually comes from SSRIs. And uh, the first bullet point there, warfarin alone increases bleeding risk. That's uh, hardly a news, news flash for anybody. Um, perhaps not as well known is that SSRIs and SNRIs uh, do appear to increase the bleeding risk. Uh, probably the purported mechanism is the inhibition of uptake of serotonin uh, into platelets and therefore uh, reducing platelet function. Um, now, multiple studies, and we're only going to show you two or three, maybe four, of uh, the studies that have shown increased bleeding risk when you combine warfarin with uh, SSRIs. 
but there are many other studies that we just didn't have time to, uh, to address. The relative risk of bleeding is, in, in, if you look at all the studies and combine them together, roughly about a doubling of the bleeding risk with the combination, but the absolute risk is, is not very high, and you'll see that in the slides that are coming up. The problem is that even though the risk is not high, the bleeding can be life-threatening, and this is what uh, some people call HILP events, H-I-L-P, high-impact, low-probability events that apply to many drug interactions, but also uh, industrial accidents and natural disasters and all sorts of other things as well. Okay, next slide. So this was a, uh, a study done in Sweden where they looked at 117 patients on warfarin and SSRIs for atrial fibrillation. Uh, the outcome was severe bleeding that resulted in hospitalization. And you can see that the uh, hazard ratio is 3.49 with the combinations uh, versus warfarin alone. Uh, these people all got either citalopram or sertraline because that's what they use in Sweden, but it almost certainly it would apply to other SSRIs as well. And over on the right, you see the bleeding. Here's where you can see that it's not a common finding. This is bleeding per 1,000 treatment years, and the warfarin plus SSRI in the red uh, is uh, roughly 50 um, out of 1,000 treatment years. So not a common event, but uh, hospitalization for bleeding obviously is uh, not a good thing. Next slide. This was a uh, cohort study of uh, patients with atrial fibrillation uh, on warfarin. And here again, the outcome was uh, hospitalization for major hemorrhage. And after they adjusted this for the underlying risk and also for the INR, uh, the uh, relative risk was 1.41 with warfarin and SSRIs compared to warfarin alone. Now, interesting uh, and expected that there's no, there was no increase in risk of hemorrhage with uh, warfarin plus tricyclics. Tricyclics do not have that same effect on the platelet serotonin, so you really wouldn't expect tricyclics to interact, and, uh, and they did not. On the right, this is hemorrhage per 100 treatment years. And again, warfarin alone, warfarin and tricyclics, pretty much the same. And then warfarin with SSRIs, roughly a doubling. Okay, next slide. Uh, this was, again, some of these studies are small. Uh, some of the other studies that uh, actually we have that we're not going to show you involved uh, uh, tens of thousands of patients and uh, they all pretty much came to the same conclusion. In this small study, uh, 46 patients uh, were on antidepressants that were getting warfarin and uh, 54 warfarin alone. And of the 46 on uh, antidepressants, about half of them were taking an SSRI. And if you look over on the right, um, the bleeding, any bleed, uh, there was somewhat of an increase, but the major bleeds, and this is, uh, has been typical for these studies, the major risk seems to be with, uh, with major bleeds rather than with any bleeds. Uh, and of course, the major bleeds are much less common. <clears throat> now, uh, the third bullet point over on the left, um, when they looked at any antidepressant, this was not uh, uh, statistically significant. And again, when you have tricyclics in there that don't interact, uh, that would be expected. Okay, the next slide. Now this is a little different kind of a study because here they looked at uh, 176 patients on warfarin who developed a uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. And when they looked at warfarin treated patients who developed hemorrhage, warfarin alone, if you look at the bar graph on the right, warfarin alone, warfarin and aspirin, and warfarin and SSRI, uh, there was a substantial increase in the risk of fatality over 30 days. Uh, with the warfarin and SSRI. So here, it was all these people had the intracerebral bleed. It was just that if they happened to be on an SSRI, they were more likely to die from it. A subsequent study, which we're not going to show you the data on, uh, suggested that SSRIs may also increase the risk of intracerebral bleeds in people on warfarin. So maybe not only the severity and the risk of dying, but also perhaps the risk as well. Of, of actually developing the bleed in the first place. Next slide. Uh, 
And this is not a drug interaction study. It's just a, uh, an example of uh, the effect that some other factor may have on the risk of, of bleeding. Um, and this is with GI bleeds, uh, and this is a study from Iceland. And uh, when, if you look at the bar graph on the right, the rate <clears throat> of uh, GI bleeding per 100,000 uh, as the person got older, uh, or as the population got older, you can see there was a much higher rate of bleeding. And they stopped at 79. So uh, from 80 on, it's not clear, but one would guess that that would even be higher than that red bar that you see there. So that uh, clearly could be one of the factors that one would consider in, the, in assessing the risk of uh, bleeding in this kind of an interaction. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so to summarize what we just went through, there's a plausible mechanism, the effect on platelet serotonin. Um, there are numerous studies that uh, support this increased risk, probably um, you know, 14 or 15 studies. There are a few, a couple that did not show a risk, but that's typical for these kinds of uh, epidemiologic studies where uh, most studies can show something and then there will always be one or two who do not uh, find the risk. Um, but in this case, I would, I would estimate that 90% of the studies that have looked at this issue have found that there is an increased risk of, uh, of bleeding with SSRIs and warfarin. Um, it, it does seem to be limited to SSRIs and SNRIs. It does not apply to tricyclics and other drugs that do not affect uh, serotonin. And overall, the risk of bleeding is increased uh, roughly twofold. Okay, the next slide. So we have tried to uh, stratify these using the, actually the ORCA uh, method of stratifying drug interactions. In, in red on the algorithms you're gonna see in a moment, uh, generally it would be best to avoid the combination if at all possible. Uh, in yellow, uh, this would be uh, situations where you would try to avoid the combination, or if you do use it, try to minimize the risk. And then green, uh, no special precautions. So next slide. This, unless your eyes are a lot better than mine, you probably can't read that, uh, but this is the overall, the, the, the bird's eye view of the algorithm we prepared for this. And on the next slide, you see a smaller, um, a section of it. So if a person is on warfarin and uh, is prescribed an antidepressant, um, if it's uh, tricyclics or bupropion, uh, they have, with the exception of chlor uh, chloramipramine, Clomipramine does, uh, is a tricyclic that does, in fact, substantially inhibit serotonin reuptake. So uh, clomipramine would uh, appear over on the, uh, it's not used very much, but it would appear over on the uh, SN. Oh, there it is right there. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dan. Um, so there it would be green, no special precautions. Mirtazapine is controversial. Some people think it has very little effect on, um, uh, on serotonin reuptake. Uh, others uh, feel that it does. But I think nobody would disagree that it's much less likely to do so or has much less potency as a serotonin reuptake inhibitor compared to the drugs on the right. Um, okay, then the next slide is the bottom half of that, um, of that algorithm. And so if the person is taking an SSRI or an SNRI, then does the patient have one or more risk factors for bleeding? If the answer is no, there's still... Um, a potential risk, so that goes to the yellow box where you assess risk and decide what to do, a possible increased risk. Uh, if they do have one of those factors, uh, history of, of uh, hemorrhagic bleeding, et cetera, then you go over to the yes side, and then it would be use only if benefit always the risk of the increased uh, bleeding. Okay, next slide. So thanks, Bill. I appreciate you covering that material for us. Um, what I'd like to do is turn it over next to Rich Boyce, who's going to talk a little bit about how this, uh, how we operationalize this algorithm and how that algorithm performs. What I should have mentioned at the top of the presentation, and I'll mention now, is that uh, we will take questions, um, and we ask you to submit those via the chat function on Zoom, and uh, we'll try to answer those as we get to the end of the presentation, at the end of our time today. 
So Rich, uh, feel free to take it away. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and um, thanks for the presentation that you did, Phil. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> All right, so you, what uh, Phil walked you through uh, in the flow diagram you saw a couple of slides ago is, the, uh, is uh, the, basically a, a decision tree or a logical flow diagram for the algorithm. Um, and what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to test that um, and validate it. And what we mean by that is uh, implement the logic um, in a, a logical language and uh, run the role against uh, data. And so this slide is showing our workflow. Um, on the left-hand side, we had two different uh, forms of data that we tested the rules against. So we have what we call synthetic EHR data, and synthetic is uh, in the sense that we uh, created the records ourselves deliberately uh, and in such a way that we wanted to test each branch of the rule. We wanted to make sure that the, um, if we created a synthetic patient that we expected to be low risk because it, they were on uh, warfarin in a tricyclic, uh, then when we ran the rule computationally, that person, you know, that synthetic person would come back as, as low risk. And similarly, if there, there was a person who was high risk because they were on an SSRI and they were, um, they had one of the, the uh, risk factors like uh, history of upper, upper GI bleed, then that synthetic person would come back. So we had synthetic uh, data. And then also we wanted to see, you know, giving a sample of electronic health records data from the real world, uh, how often would the different branches of the rule trigger? So there's two forms of validation that we're talking about here. Uh, now, for both of these, we used um, we needed to have a, a, a model which represented the clinical data. Uh, so we used the OMOP or Odyssey Common Data Model (OHDSI) that stands for Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics. Um, it's a, a open source uh, data model. is It's well documented. It's widely used, um, and we were comfortable using that. So the bottom of the box that says data model, you'll see that there were tables for person uh, records that would describe the person, such as their, their birth year and, uh, and, and gender and so forth. And then there was uh, other tables which represented what conditions the person uh, had and um, something about their visit and what lab measurements were taken and uh, the drug uh, exposure in this case, which we were modeling as, uh, as drug orders. And then on, on the top box, uh, because we were using, uh, these rules were implemented using standard uh, terminologies for the drugs and conditions and so forth, there's a table which had the, the terminology, word. that's the concept table. And as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, there's another table called concept set, uh, which is synonymous with value set. You'll have me talk about value sets a little bit later. And that's basically a way of organizing codes from the terminology so we could represent what we exactly mean by, for example, SSRI or warfarin, and that would be, for example, in that case, the list of Rx norm um, identifiers that were for the clinical drugs that fall into that drug class. So with that in place, uh, you know, we had one instance of the database for the synthetic uh, uh, data, and then we had one instance from the real world data, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Then we ran um, an engine called DROLS, D-R-O-L-S, which is a widely used enterprise level um, logic, logical system. And uh, that would connect to the database and then run the rules. And again, what we got, got as output were records of where synthetic or patients from the retrospective real world data, uh, where they would land in terms of risk. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more about the testing of the, uh, using the synthetic data. Um, again, just to illustrate here, we, we manually uh, added to the, um, common data model records that would uh, represent patients from each of the branches. So we had patients with drug exposures for SSRI and additional risk factor of G, uh, for, such as GI bleeding. We had patients with S, uh, warfarin, SSRI, and no additional risk factors, and so on, so that we could test all branches of the rule. And uh, we would consider the rule validated um, if we, we could run the logic of the rule against the synthetic data and we would pull back exactly the number of patients that we had created in the synthetic data set for each branch. Can you go on to the next, please? Thank you. 
for the real world data, we uh, obtained IRB uh, exemption and we had three months of retrospective data from the University of Arizona Medical Center, um, specifically from January 1st, 2016 through the 31st of March, 2016. Um, the domains that were extracted were the patient um, demographics, diagnosis, drug orders, conditions, labs. And, uh, and when we loaded that data in total, we have 25,000 patients over that time period with an average age range of 43 years. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, the, um, and what I guess I didn't mention previously is that with the synthetic data, we were successful in validating all of the um, branches. So the real world data now will tell you about what, uh, what came out of that. So this is a flow diagram, uh, which is showing the logic of the rule again. So at the top, there's a, if there's a patient in that real world data set who's exposed to warfarin and also an antidepressant. And then what we'll show is over the, th the, the sample of data that we uh, ran, the, there were 468 patients during that th three month period who were concomitantly exposed to warfarin and antidepressant. And could you move forward? Of those 468, four of them were tricyclic as the antidepressant, which that would put them in the low risk of the algorithm. We had no mirtazapine a concomitant exposure with warfarin in this, in this sample. And then for the SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, we had 96 that did not have one of the major risk factors that was described previously. And we had a total of the last one, 368 that did. So what we're showing here is that in the real world data set, the, um, the algorithm uh, was able to discriminate um, uh, over 20% of the cases as being lower risk. Um, than the, the highest risk category. So there's some, some good discrimination that we saw from this algorithm in the real world data set. Next slide, please. Okay, so Dan, would you like to talk briefly about the uh, website? And then I can take a, talk about some of the other aspects of the uh, implementation and testing. Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks, Rich, and thanks, Phil. So uh, one of the goals of our project is not to just create um, academic research, but to try to move this into um, clinical care arena. Um, so what we've done is created a website with the opportunity to use the algorithms that we've developed and they're put them out there as open source um, materials so that individuals who are interested in implementing one or more of our algorithms have the tools to do it. So um, here you're so, we're showing the URL for our uh, website and also the warfarin uh, antidepressant specific um, uh, uh, drug pair. So um, on each of the drug pairs that we're um, focusing on for, for this particular project, we're trying to provide uh, the background information that would be useful to a clinical committee who might be uh, implementing clinical decision rules within the organization. And one of the things that we thought was important as a part of this is to document why we've done what we've done with our algorithm. So we have a short document that describes the interaction and also the rationale behind our algorithm. And it also provides the algorithm. So this information can be um, implemented into a document that could be shared with members of that committee um, if, if you're uh, so interested. Then uh, we have a number of artifacts or resources that are available um, for you to use to help um, actually implement the algorithm in your environment. Um, first and foremost, we have a PDF of the algorithm that we've just shown you. Um, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to Rich to talk about some of the other uh, tools that we have in our um, website. Thank you, Dan. Um, so this, uh, if, if for those of folks who go up to the website to the page that was shown previously, you'll, you'll see the, this list of uh, items up there, starting from underneath the PDF of the flow diagram. Um, the actual code that we use for uh, implementing the logic of the rule and testing it is available for those who are interested in looking at how it was implemented using tools with the um, OHDSI OMOP common data model. Uh, we also have a Docker 
uh, container. Uh, so for folks who are more IT oriented, that, that allows you to take the environment that we use for testing and, um, and run it in, a, in the Docker environment on your own machine. And you, you can literally run the tests um, that we ran. Uh, we also have set it up so that if you have data in the OMOP common data model, um, you, know, you should be able to point the rule engine to your, your data and be able to test things. And then we have artifacts uh, for, from clinical quality language, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, and then we have the actual value sets. Um, and I, we think this is very important to provide because again, what we mean by SSRIs and what we mean by NSAIDs and so forth uh, is clearly articulated or enumerated in these value sets. Um, so, um, so those are available. And then uh, we've set up uh, a discussion forum. Folks can also email us through info at ddi-cds.org. We'll show that information with everybody on the call. Next slide, please. Okay, so I said I would talk a little bit more about clinical quality language. Um, this, is, this is actually important that we uh, implemented the rules in CQL because it's a health HL7 standard for trial use right now. Um, uh, organizations like uh, Medic uh, CMS are uh, really behind developing CQL and trying to promote it as a language for shareable decision support artifacts. Uh, so at this point, we have taken the logic of the rule and we've implemented it in the CQL. And then we've used a similar approach to what I described earlier with, uh, with the OMOP common data model, where we generated synthetic patients, but these synthetic patients were actually fire patients and fire medication um, plan resources and so forth. And then we ran the logic against those fire resources. Um, so that's, that's available for folks to check out. Next slide, please. And then again, as I mentioned, the, the, Docker, and, uh, the Docker container has the tools implementation where you can actually see the code up on GitHub. There's a link here. For those of you who are interested, you can you can see all the resources related to our testing there to help you see more specifically and concretely what we did. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, about value sets. You've heard me throw that word out there multiple times, and uh, it's not familiar to everybody. So just to uh, articulate a little more clearly, so value sets are collections of codes for one or more term terminologies. Uh, for the use cases that we are dealing with, uh, the figure on the right kind of illustrates that value sets can be constructed for drugs from a variety of different terminologies. In our case, we're using Rx norm. Um, for the clinical consequences, again, there's several terminologies that are available. Uh, we built, developed our, our clinical um, consequence or um, conditions and so forth value sets using ICD-9 and ICD-10. Um, and then you see on the bottom of that figure that the thing called the value set data repository and what we're doing here is we're, we're using um, both GitHub, which provides uh, a document which says how did, we, how did we come by putting these things together, and also provides just a text file that has the specific code uh, that are in the value sets. We're also using the National Library of Medicine's, National Library of Medicine's Value Set Authority Center. And that's, uh, some folks will be familiar with that. That's kind of important because that's uh, uh, kind of a persistent location uh, for these value sets, and it allows um, people to download them. And as people download them, they can be updated um, uh, to the current uh, version of the terminology. Can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, just a little bit about that. When you see, like some of you might be clicking on links right now and trying to see the terminologies and the, va the value set authority, you do have to have a UMLS account. Uh, it's free. The reason for that is because SNOMED is not internationally free. Um, and maybe there's some other terminologies and value sets up on uh, the value set authority where they require folks to, uh, you know, state basically their location so that they can, uh, they can um, legally share with you things like SOMED value sets. It's not relevant for our use case, but it's just how the value set authority works. So for folks who don't have an account, just go ahead and register. It's free and national and um, we'll sell your information or anything. Go to the next slide, please. And this is what one looks like on the value set authority. Again, you can go to our GitHub site or you can ask us and we'll email you a text file with the list of the codes. But uh, up here you would see um, the, the list showing as such where you would have the code and then the description and what version of the terminology this came from. And you could click on any of those to see some more detail. There is also an API. There's a way to programmatically access this. 
information as well, which we can share with you more about that if you're interested. Next slide, please. That's it. So back to you, Dion. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rich. Well, um, over the past uh, 35 minutes or so, we've been talking about how many drug interactions are slipping through our safety nets. And our goal with this particular project and subsequent webinars that we plan to deliver is to figure out different ways to design that safety net so that we identify those patients who are likely at risk to have a true drug-drug interaction and we um, mitigate the warnings or, lim or reduce the number of warnings for situations where the patient's uh, li not likely to be harmed. Um, Dr. Hanston provided the uh, clinical rationale and evidence that warfarin and SSRIs and SNRIs do increase the risk of bleeding, um, but these are not necessarily specific to all antidepressants. So um, it's important to kind of uh, segregate those medications into the appropriate categories uh, when developing uh, warning systems for this. And we recognize that it's a challenge for the um, uh, drug knowledge vendors to keep up to date with, with some of these uh, different contextualization issues. And that's why we've tried to create our um, medication uh, value sets so that uh, this would allow an individual to um, implement some of our algorithms with, without having to, to recreate the wheel. Um, we are trying to create alerts that are contextual to both the medication and the patient. And our overall goal with this project has, has been to at least knock down a little bit of the excess of learning that's associated with drug interaction warnings. Um, we are working on some additional algorithms. If I can uh, move to our next slide here. Um, so up on our website, we, we do have some work uh, with warfarin and NSAIDs that's uh, available, uh, warfarin and salicylates. Warfarin is not the only medication that we're gonna focus on with our algorithms, but those are the ones that we uh, uh, have um, started to put the materials available. We have additional ones that are gonna be uh, coming soon. Uh, many of you may have received notice of this webinar because of uh, your affiliation with a pharmacy PGY2 residency in uh, uh, pharmacy informatics. Um, we think that these algorithms might be um, implementation and evaluation of these algorithms within your healthcare system might be a useful residency project. In addition, our our team is interested in learning about how these algorithms work in your environment. So um, in the future, you may be hearing from us asking for feedback about our algorithms and, and how they've worked or, or what hasn't worked with them. So uh, we view this as a partnership with our program. Um, and we want you to feel free to reach out to us and, and tell us about your experiences and let us know some of the pitfalls or some of the advantages of doing what, we, what we're proposing. We know that um, you know, there's lots of issues about implementing clinical decision support in a meaningful manner uh, in healthcare institutions. And this is not, it's easier said than done. Um, there's lots of barriers to doing it. Uh, we hope that this webinar series will start to uh, lower some of the barriers for uh, contextualizing drug interaction warnings. And uh, not to say that we've built a perfect model, but at least we've built a model and that others will build upon this and allow you to um, reduce the alert burden for your particular um, uh, providers. So with that, I just wanna again acknowledge the um, funding of this particular project comes from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. We appreciate their support of this project and, and their other work in relationship to uh, improving drug safety. So now we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to put it into the question and answer uh, box and we'll try to address those. And uh, um, I'll go to, go to that. I'm gonna look to see what questions we have. So, so there is um, a question about um, uh, novel or um, uh, direct acting oral anticoagulants with respect to um, I, I'm, I'm assuming the question is referring to SSRIs as well. Um, our particular algorithm focuses on war, uh, warfarin because that's where the evidence is. Uh, Bill, do you want to address any issues with the, 
the novel or new anticoagulants or any issues there? Um, yes, uh, there, th yes, there's very little information on those. Uh, there's a lot of data with warfarin and very little information. There are uh, one or two studies, but not enough to really know yet what, uh, what would be going on with those. You could theoretically assume that if it's a platelet effect that it would uh, increase the risk of bleeding with those newer agents as well. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And, and one of the goals with our project is to try to identify the relevant evidence so that, again, when you're going to a committee to review a particular, particular algorithm, it, it's, it's not just based upon um, a presumption of uh, relationships. We're, we're trying to document those relationships as much as the evidence will allow us to document those relationships. Uh, another question we have is, um, have we thought about comparing our algorithms versus uh, proprietary or out-of-the-box algorithms or, or, or situations? That's a great question. Um, we haven't done that work. Um, we recognize that there might be other organizations or vendors that would be um, uh, working on these projects. And, and in fact, I, I, we have relationships with those organizations in so much that we're trying to keep them informed of what we're doing. Um, and, but we haven't seen any direct head-to-head -head comparisons. And, um, but as those uh, vendors become aware of our work, um, if they're willing to share back with us that information, how our algorithms work uh, versus something that they've done, uh, we would welcome that. Uh, we don't think that uh, we're necessarily 100% perfect. We're, we realize that uh, there's lots of nuances that go into building these and there's um, issues associated with um, um, where you branch and how you branch. And uh, we, we're not gonna say that uh, um, we've done it the best way. We've tried to do it a, a good way. So um, we don't want the perfect to get in the way of the good and to reduce some of the alert fatigue. So, so that's a great question. Um, so a question about have we started discussing this with the HR vendors? Um, yes, we have. Um, we have talked to some of the HR vendors about this. Um, so there's a couple issues that come into play with the EHR vendors. So one of it is, so some of the attributes of uh, tailoring these um, algorithms, um, we, haven't, we didn't focus on today, but uh, others that we'll share with you focus on such things as dose of the medication. And those not may not be those tools may not yet be built into the EHR systems, so um, we're trying to bring uh, them along on some of our, our thoughts and processes. But some of those tools may not be available yet. We do we do know that some of the algorithms we'll, we'll share with you over the course of this project um, are either implemented already or are available in the toolbox within the EHR vendor or or near implement implementable uh, within the HR vendor. So um, that is uh, um, coming forward from the HR vendors. And again, we're not trying to supplant the HR vendors and their tools. We're trying to provide uh, additional uh, resources for everyone. Is there any other questions that we have? I think we've, um, a question, have we implemented our own hospitals or institutions? Um, that's an excellent question. And uh, the, the short answer is no. I guess the, we're just now trying to unveil these and uh, we haven't had a chance to, um, to, to uh, implement them within our own environment. I will say that, you know, I, I kind of sit in an ivory tower as an as a academic researcher. I'm not in the production environment. Um, we have some ongoing uh, relationships and I'm in a new facility, new organization. So building those relationships. So I haven't had a chance to implement them yet. So I, I can't tell you how they're gonna perform. So I, hopefully we will have that information in the future. All right, I think we've answered all the questions at the moment. We're, for those of you that are on the webinar, um, we are going to provide a uh, downloadable version of this, or at least a, uh, a recording of this that others could, could view it in the future. So look for that on our website. Again, if you have any questions or issues with uh, our tools, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us directly. Um, 
and those uh, email addresses, I'll put them back up on the screen here for you in, in just a second. Um, uh, we can get the uh, computer to cooperate. Uh, it wants to go back here. Um, you can em email us at info at ddicds.org or you can contact me directly at Dan Malone, dan.malone at utah.edu or Rich Boyce at rdb20 at pitt.edu. Thank you all for attending today and uh, best wishes for continued success in your environments. Have a great day.